Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Guys, great episode, great topic, great guest for you. This is how to fix DeFi tokens. We have Hasu, who is a prominent researcher, and I think one of the best people on earth positioned to talk about this with us. We talk about why DeFi tokens are broken and how to fix them. This is really the hard work we have to do during the bear market. Look out for these takeaways. Number one, we discuss what's broken about DeFi tokens today. Number two, we discuss why all roads seem to lead back to regulatory? Question mark. We talk about number three, why the West might actually be the last to embrace crypto. Number four, we talk about why fixing governance is the key to fixing DeFi tokens. We have to do that first. And Hasu dropped some tips for DAOs as well. And number five, we talk about why we have to fix DeFi tokens if we want to end the bear market. This is key as well, making DeFi tokens an investable asset class, shoring up our investor protections there. David, this was a really fascinating discussion um, with Hasi. What did you think? There are, I have so many things to say. Um, the, uh, some of them I'll have, definitely have to save for the debrief. Uh, I, if for the listeners that listened to my very quick interview with Kane Warwick out of ECC, he talked about this meta of in 2017, the scoreboard was how much can your ICO raise? In 2020, the scoreboard was how much can your yield farm get up in TVL? And then he predicted the next bull market, the next scoreboard will be how much fees can your protocol generate? And that third scoreboard is intimately tied to this conversation that we just had with Hazu because how much fees can your protocol generate is going to be a function of uh, the, the quality of the protocol, not necessarily the thing that's broken, but the quality of how well that DAO can organize around those fees and capture those fees and direct value back to token holders. This is the thing that is broken today is that we have stellar protocols and fundamentally broken DAOs. We have fundamentally broken DAO structures. And we need to fix that DAO side of things to, to bridge the, the fee flows that these protocols are just printing. They're, all, they're money printers, but we don't have the pipe between the money printer and the DAO to fund operations, to pay for contributors. And we go through all the, the variables, all the, the aspects of DAOs that need to be fixed in order to build this bridge between the fees that some DAOs are, are absolutely printing right now and then the actual organization that governs over these things. Uh, so th this is the conversation. I have so much more to say, Ryan. Uh, so we'll have to talk about it in the debrief. No, we will talk about that in the debrief. The de debrief, of course, is our episode after the episode where you get David and I's raw thoughts. Uh, if you're a premium subscriber, you get that and we'll include a link for you to become a premium subscriber. It's really a fantastic episode. And I think if you're a DeFi investor, you want to pay close attention to this episode because we talk about um, what's going to be required to make this a much more investable asset class as well. One of the big themes that we've said on Bankless is we we're speed running the, the history of money and finance. Then that quickly turned over into DAOs. We are also speed running the history of human coordination systems. And this that theme is part of what we're talking about today, where we this is actually a science that human humanity has already perfected. It's corporate governance, it's human organization. We already know the answers to these things. We just need to learn how to apply them in a new DAO context. And so one of the big themes for this episode is how do we apply the lessons that we've already learned as a species onto this new form factor, which is DAOs. And so uh, the listeners should think in that frame as they go throughout this episode. Guys, we're going to get right to our episode with Hasu. But before we do, we want to tell you about these awesome tools for going bankless. MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol, the first DeFi protocol to ever exist, even before we called it DeFi. MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. And there's something new in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Every time a new Maker vault is opened, the owner can claim a POAP, which contributes funds to One Tree Planted, an organization with ongoing global reforestation efforts, creating a world where digital participation and the health of our environment can live side by side. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains and layer twos, bringing the biggest and best DeFi credit facility to everywhere there is DeFi. Today, you can mint DAI on Oasis.app, DeFi Saver, or other DeFi protocols that you use. So follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. 
There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on, and now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. Rocket Pool is your decentralized Ethereum staking protocol. You can stake your ETH in Rocket Pool and get our ETH in return, allowing you to stake your ETH and use it in DeFi at the same time. You can get 4% on your ETH by staking it with Rocket Pool, but you can get even more by running a node. Rocket Pool is the only staking provider that allows anyone to permissionlessly join their network of validating Ethereum nodes. Setting up your Rocket Pool node is easier than running a node solo, and you only need 16 ETH to get started. You get an extra 15% staking commission on the pooled ETH that uses your your node to stake. You also get RPL token rewards on top. So if you're bullish ETH staking, you can boost your yield by adding your node to the decentralized Rocket Pool network, which currently has over 1,000 independent node operators. It's yield farming, but with Ethereum nodes. You can get started at rocketpool.net, and you can also join the Rocket Pool community in their Discord. You can find me hanging out there sometimes in the chat, so I'll see you there. Hey, Bankless Nation, we're super excited to introduce you yet again to Hasu. Hasu has been on the podcast before. He's a crypto economic researcher, pseudo-anonymous. He's helping to build the frontier in many different directions. He's a researcher at Paradigm. He works strategy at Flashbots, solving, helping to solve the MEV problem. He's also a podcaster as well, a governor, a delegate in many DeFi protocols such as MakerDAO. And overall, he's uh, definitely a DeFi governance big thinker. So um, wanted to bring Hasu on. And I guess the original topic for today was how we can fix DeFi tokens. But I think in talking to Hasu pre-show, David and Hasu and I concluded that there might not be a clean answer on how to fix DeFi tokens. Right, right. So I think... The orientation of this podcast is really the question, can DeFi tokens be fixed? Hasu, welcome to Bankless. We're excited to uh, have this discussion with you. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Hey, David. Uh, thanks for having me back on. Okay. I'm going to tee this up and just set this up. I feel like DeFi tokens, and I think maybe many people uh, in crypto feel like DeFi tokens are somewhat broken right now, at least from a value accrual perspective. So the idea is many of our DeFi protocols actually are working really well. Like Maker is working pretty darn well. Uniswap, uh, historic volumes, it's driving more uh, transaction revenue than Ethereum at this point in time. Uh, Aave has proven itself in ways that the CeFi lenders could not during this cycle. And yet, the value accrual for DeFi tokens has been somewhat disappointing, leads to the conclusion that, that maybe they're a bit broken right now. First, Hasu, what do you think about that statement? Do you agree that DeFi tokens are kind of broken in their current form? And what about them is broken? Mm, first of all, I guess, um, so you're saying that DeFi protocols do a really good job, but um, the value accrual of the token is is a bit disappointing, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't really over index on uh, how the DeFi protocols have done uh, in sort of this credit um, contraction that we've seen um, it, over the last month. I mean, the DeFi protocols, fortunately, they haven't gotten into the business of unsecured lending yet, which is what really drive all of these lenders into bankruptcy. And so th you have a pretty easy explanation for why they came out of this um, better than the CFA lenders, which is that they only offered repo lending. So they're just all over collateralized yeah, is what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, MakerDAO has like a small amount of sort of uncollateralized lending, but 
that, that was sort of is completely orthogonal to um, the crypto space. Um, but also there's yeah. examples in DeFi of like Uniswap and Synthetics, for example, unrelated to lending, unrelated to cl uh, collateral that are also driving a ton of fees. So yes, I, I take the argument that just like the over collateralized nature of DeFi lenders ma makes mm -hmm. them meaningfully different than CeFi lenders. But I think the real conversation is a lot of these DeFi apps are directing cash flows, are, are, are directing fees. And yet none of those fees are falling into the hands of value capture into the token. Uh, there, we're not really seeing growth in the organization behind these protocols. And we're not seeing, basically we're not mm -hmm. seeing token price go up. We're kind of just seeing uh, a leaking, a, a leaky ship. Uh, no matter what DeFi protocol you're looking at, you're not really seeing any of these protocols capturing and maintaining value as a function of the fees that they are collecting in this space. Would you agree with that? Um, partially. I mean, I think Uniswap, for example, is still worth $7 billion fully diluted. Um, I think off the top of Matt Lido, are they somewhere between $1 and $2 billion? Uh, I make around $1 billion. So they are, like we have DeFi unicorns, right? Um, I, I don't think that the variation is extremely unfair or anything. Um, if anything, they probably went up too high. I think, I mean, as is kind of expected in, in the cycle uh, of crypto that we see, like, uh, as like kind of speculative mania. Um, but I mean, nonetheless, it's really impressive to create, like in the real world, we would say it's extremely impressive to create a unicorn company. Um, and, and so I, I think these companies are doing quite well, but maybe not as well as they could do if investors had more faith that these, um, I mean, they, that sort of certain overhangs would be eliminated. Right. And we can sort of get into what these are. I mean, um, one is basically just to go like very briefly through them. I mean, um, so they don't, they tend to not have sort of, uh, you know, effective management. Um, why? Because, um, these protocols need to be decentralized. Um, they don't, they tend not to do any marketing at all. Um, because then you get into securities regulation. Um, they tend to, uh, you know, uh, have really broad token issuance. Um, they tend to not uh, drive any revenue to their token and, and so on. So, um, and furthermore, we are in a market that is extremely cyclical. So investors don't really like very cyclical markets. Um, and in, in many ways, I mean, sort of, um, I guess the staying power of DeFi, DeFi has only been around for two years uh, at this point. Um, so, I mean, as an investor, it feels warranted to put a large discount on, um, on DeFi tokens before you see some of these sort of regulatory uh, overhangs and uh, eliminated. Just to really drive this point home, you put out an article that was more or less, I think, close to the top of the bull market, talking about uh, the actual uh, uh, fleeting nature of all these DeFi treasuries, where we was like, you, we looked at the Uniswap treasury and we saw $4 billion, and then we actually took a peek under the hood and it was all uni tokens, which you were arguing doesn't really count as a treasury when it's denominated in an asset that the protocol can just freely mint if they so desire. Uh, and so like, if I wanted to, I could go mint a token, put it on Uniswap and then mint 10 trillion of them in the back end, <laughs> and I could claim that I have like a trillion dollar treasury. It doesn't really work like that. Yeah. Your treasury should really only be denominated in external assets and perhaps just mainly monies, ether, Bitcoin and stable coins. And so you made this argument that the size of these treasuries were actually extremely at risk from uh, a bear market, which we tend to always know comes in crypto and then tends to always be, you know, 90% drawdowns. And that's kind of what we've seen in a lot of DeFi treasuries. And so this conversation of are DeFi tokens broken? Is there a missing link between protocol revenues and DeFi DAO treasuries, I think is really, really salient. And when I say the words like we have a leaky ship, is that we have these DAOs, we have these orgs that govern over DeFi protocols on chain, and those protocols direct cash flows, direct fees, but those the fees that they are not directing, uh, that they are directing, are not going into the treasuries of DAOs. 
meaning that we cannot pay for labor, we cannot pay for you know, like capital expenses, we can't really grow these organizations uh, in a meaningful way that has you know been tried and true throughout time. Would you agree with all these statements? Yeah, and I think the, the, the reason why it makes sense to bring up the, the treasury debate from last year is that this, this proves to me that most DeFi protocols are not run like businesses. Mm -hmm. um, because if you were like, if you were actually running your, your protocol, like a business, then you would make sure that, um, you know, it has sufficient liquidity, um, to pay wages and invest throughout the bear market. But we are seeing the opposite. We are seeing that, uh, many protocols did very poor treasury management and now find themselves in a position where, you know, they have to reduce the headcount, they have to stop incentive programs, they have to raise money near the, um, sort of uh, at peak low prices. And this is all things that, um, I mean, if you had someone in charge of treasury management, uh, who had worked at a traditional company before, I mean, these are very basic things basically. And, uh, um, I think if projects thought of themselves more as businesses, then you wouldn't see some of these easy mistakes. Yeah. What's interesting to me is it feels like, um, like the, the simple question and the, the simple question to me, and maybe sort of an archetype for, uh, the protocol works incredibly well, but the token feels like it's a little bit broken is probably the uni token. Right. And the, the criticisms of the uni token right now are, oh, it's just a governance token. And by the way, governance doesn't work very well. Go look at the kind of the, the Uniswap governance forms and, and you can kind of see. And it doesn't even have value accrual attached to it right now. And so like Uniswap, incredible protocol working very well, showing what DeFi is capable of, but that is not translating into a token that is delivering value back to investors. And what's interesting to me is like, there's different answers to this. Like some, some people uh, would actually say, Uniswap should not have a token at all. What, why are you even introducing a token in the first place? It should just be a protocol that kind of works and there's no need for a token. So why don't we just eliminate the token? That's one potential answer to this problem. Um, another is from, I guess, the uni investor perspective, why don't we just turn on fees? Let's start there. Let's start getting some revenue, I suppose, into the protocol so we can have some fees to govern. Of course, there's there's lots of, of governance issues to work through on the other side of that that we could, we could step into. But why don't we just turn on fees? I want to ask you about maybe these first two things. Like, so first, why does Uniswap even need a token? Maybe some of the critics are right that some of these protocols should be tokenless. And then secondly, if there is an argument for Uniswap to have a token, why, why haven't we just turned on fees yet? Why haven't the governors done that yet? Okay, so I think to get into the first question, um, depends what you mean by token. Uh, whether it's like, whether you mean that uh, Uniswap should, could in theory be owned by like one person, one company, one family without putting any sort of shares on the secondary market, which is one valid interpretation, or whether Uniswap should like benefit no one and be sort of a completely free open source project that doesn't ever charge a fee. And I do mean that more the public yeah, good model. The, I mean, the, the answer is basically that uh, you can do that, but there's not going to be a, another Uniswap after that. So I think you need the ability for um, you know, people to get rich in order to have, um, you know, a funding market for these things. So, um, if, if you need the token can never, you know, pay back the investment that sort of the, the investors made in it, then, uh, basically the, the primary funding market also is going to dry up and then we we'll just have a lot less, um, innovation in the, in DeFi projects. So I think that the founders and investors need to be able to get rich from this or you will just see no further projects. And so I think it follows to say that this is kind of the core argument as to why everything has a token. Because if you don't have a token, somebody will just copy you and then make a token. And then now that's kind of the new the new shelling point. And it's an arms race, right? It's a little fact, bit. That, it's that's a little why, bit of an arms race. Yeah. That's why Uniswap did this in the first place, you right. might argue, as a response to a competitor, sushi swap. And so I, I think there's, I think Kazi, you'd agree with me is that DAOs have a 
uh, ma many DAOs, many DeFi apps have an undefined vision for themselves. You know, what are we? What is Uniswap? Is it a public good? Is it a for-profit exchange? Uh, and I think the argument that we're making is like everything kind of boils down into a for-profit value capture governance token that governs over a DeFi protocol. Would you agree with that conclusion? I think I think that if the answer to that is yes, then that's the brightest possible future for DeFi, right? Because if there's no value accrual, then I think the space of possible innovation in the future is going to be a lot lower. lower. Whereas if investors learn that you can make a lot of money from DeFi tokens, then you will attract a lot of great founders, great teams, you will unlock a lot of financial innovation, and you'll have a very uh, deep and liquid market for funding these projects in the first place. Okay, so we're, we're now operating under a paradigm that everything is going to have a token. The, the best token governance, the best DAO governance that leverages the powers that their token enables to them to best govern over their protocol, make the best protocol possible, which captures the best fees possible, will be the, the protocol that wins. Honestly, this feels like very basic business 101, and we just kind of forget this, that we are not like escaping just like, 101 rational economic truths by being in the crypto space, we still follow the laws of economics. We still follow the laws of incentives. And so may the best protocol win. And the protocol that wins is the one that, you know, drives a bunch of revenue to the DAO, grows the organization, uh, and ultimately rewards token holders. Uh, yeah? Yeah? We on the same page? Yeah. I mean, I, I would think so, yeah. I mean, so that begs the question then, in, the, in the, kind of the second point or the second criticism or the second question people have about something like the the uni token why not turn on fees <laughs> why don't they just do that why hasn't this been done and we are seeing proposals that have come out over time and uh i think um some action has maybe been heating up in the last week or two around serious proposals to turn on the uniswap fee switch but i'm curious what's the history here why hasn't that been done previously do you think and is does does it feel like governance is broken because we can't do this simple thing? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think it means governance is broken. So why haven't we turned on the fees in Uniswap? Um, I think there are very good business reasons why we haven't done it. So um, so traditional sort of um, Silicon Valley uh, you know startup canon would be um, first you like in these kind of network based businesses businesses with network effects, which definitely Uniswap um, kind of, uh, you know, this applies to it as well, um, because you have a, a two-sided market between, you know, traders and market makers. Um, really what you want to do is you kind of, you want to grow the network um, as much as possible. Um, and then only then when sort of your yeah, users have a switching cost uh, to another network uh, and gain more utility from being in your network than in another network, that, that's when you start to uh, monetize and you can monetize up to their exit cost. So that would be kind of the traditional, you know, um, VC way of thinking about these networks. Uh, so Hasi, this is like why Amazon you, right. ran with no profit for like, you know, decades and why Facebook didn't even have a revenue model, like, you know, four or five years into its business. It's it's for, to build that network effect. Yeah, is that correct? Uber, I mean, Uber still uh, loses money on every ride. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this, these networks can require uh, like 10 years of investment um, before they uh, are so big or YouTube, for example, didn't run any ads for, the first seven to eight years, right? Uh, and only when sort of the library of videos and the algorithm and everything was so strong that the users didn't really have an alternative to YouTube, that's when they slowly started sort of to ramp up, um, you know, the adverts and and started to roll out YouTube Premium and, and all of this stuff, right? So um, that's why you can definitely point to business logic and say, hey, that's why you know so shouldn't turn on the switch the fee switch today. Um, but I think that there is still uh, doubt in, you know, the general market's mind whether, uh, you know, so even if it would make sense, uh, we're in, in a position to turn on the fees. So I think that's definitely also um, a factor. What about that second bucket? Um, so let's say I, I, I totally understand the, the argument of not turning on the fees on, on something like the Uniswap protocol. 
of we're building network effect and um you know we want to make this as low cost as possible to outcompete our competitors and build the, the the biggest network uh and all of that um and, and yet on the other side there, there could be the business case uh to do this you know turn it turning on fees for instance uh you got to think that that would be a positive catalyst for the value of the uni token for one and if the dow has a lot of uni in its treasury then that makes it more valuable, um, which is a good thing, can be spent on other you know, aspects of, of growing the Uniswap protocol. Um, also, of course, this starts to create the first revenue stream, like a, a real way to uh, bolster a DAO's treasury with actual revenue rather than just kind of their own token. And so this is a positive thing that could be poured back into investments in the business. Uh, and could be used to kind of expand the Uniswap protocol. Buying so stadium, I, I could perhaps. also see, yeah, I could also see like the other side of the business argument, which is like we don't have to, you know, p put up um, transaction fees to to kind of maximum. But why don't we start somewhere at some low fee, just so we could start this process and be able to just govern, a signal govern this cash to the flow. market, Maybe. just a signal to the market. Yeah, we're turning on a point zero 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 one percent fee. Yeah, that would, exactly. be, that, that that would be, be enough. Or maybe just turn it on for some pools, right? Just to prove that you can. Right. But I want to give you sort of the counter right. the counter argument why you shouldn't do it. Uh, so right now, if you turn on the fees, if like if you turn on fees for the entire protocol, I think what 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 will happen is, um, I mean, Uniswap, anyone can sort of fork Uniswap. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, Uniswap doesn't really have sort of a network effect that goes beyond like one pool, right? So even if it's just one pool, every single pool can be forked and sort of replicated in a cheaper way. But I think you get to, you can get to a point where that's not possible. And that's sort of, it seems to me from an outside view, um, sort of what Uniswap is doing which is sort of vertical integration, right? Uniswap want to control um, a lot more layers of the trading stack than they do today. Um, what could that mean? And that, uh, so um, that could include like a wallet, uh, a custody solution, an MEV solution, a margin solution. And then once you have sort of all of these and they have all of these friction points together by having them all from, from sort of one hand, Uniswap can become a lot harder to fork. And so it can make sense to grow the pie until all of these layers exist. And Uniswap is sort of a more vertical, vertically integrated exchange slash wallet slash custody solution. And then um, Uniswap, the protocol could still turn on the fees just sort of um, with a much stronger lock-in. Um, so I think that would be the counterpoint. That's so interesting. And that's just also just so much more to build. Uh, to your point. And the question is like, where does that building happen and how does that get funded? Right? Because it feels, it, it seems to be the case that DAO governance in its current state for something like Uniswap is not sophisticated, does not have the business processes, does not have the management processes to pull something like that off. That feels like a, a complicated multi-product sort of investment strategy that almost requires like a, a centralized brain and entity right and i know you know not to p pick on uniswap this entire time but it is as i say kind of an archetype for all of yeah, all of these DAOs, really but like uniswap exactly. has a labs That's function as well which yeah, is somewhat uniswap interesting has exactly yeah and uniswap right? uniswap has okay so that is the brain for this thing and that is an organized entity and i guess uniswap labs i mean they they're most recently they uh, acquired um an nft aggregation company right genie, and so yeah. genie right so is that is the idea that that becomes the brain but then all of the other stuff that you just kind of you talked about that um uniswap needs to build as part of its comprehensive strategy the value of all of those things where do they go it's not clear that the value flows back to the uni token maybe it goes to equity in uniswap labs this is very confusing to me <laughs> and i think to everyone in the in the crypto space trying to figure out what's the value of these DeFi protocols um yeah, exactly. So for one, I think um, you have Uniswap uh, Labs, which feels like it's pursuing like a strategy like that. Yeah, um, but that doesn't mean that, for example, Uniswap DAO couldn't also pursue a similar strategy, and it it wouldn't even necessarily need to like its its only lever is not the fee switch, right? 
Uniswap DAO can also be run just like Uniswap Labs. Like maybe it can become second prong to Uniswap Labs, or maybe it beca can become something more like um, like a headquarters, right? That where sort of you see Uniswap Labs as one supplier to um, sort of the Uniswap ecosystem, but then there can be um, there can be other suppliers. Um, and um, for example, the Uniswap DAO could do uh, like a token financing, right? They could sell tokens to the market and raise an actual treasury and then start to invest that in projects that they think will make the Uniswap protocol better. And um, maybe it is time for uh, the Uniswap community to start taking over the DAO and put in, you know, slowly put in place sort of governance processes in order to manage such an expansion. If, if they were to do that, Hasu, I guess from a, the comment on, on governance sophistication, it, it doesn't feel like DeFi token governance is there yet to be able to have the sophistication that you just, that you just mentioned, right? It feels like the most efficient way for capital to organize, if you want kind of a central brain or decision make, maker, um, like is still a entity, a corporate entity that's re a business that's registered somewhere. Are, are you optimistic that DAO governance can become a bit more business-like and capital efficient? And like, what's the gap in order to, to get there where we have a Uniswap DAO that is able to execute on a similar vision as, as an entity like Uniswap Labs? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I think I am... I'm definitely optimistic. Um, I think the the problems right now are being recognized in the space and a lot of DAOs are suffering from the exact same problems. And I think they'll all come to a similar conclusion. Um, I mean, some might come to a different conclusion, but I'm not too optimistic about those. And um, I mean, maybe it makes sense sort of to describe the status quo of, you know, most DAOs, most DAOs tend to have, um, you know, just kind of uh, one token, one vote, voting schemes um, where um, anyone can make a proposal. And then sometimes you have like, um, like attempt checks via snapshot. So those are not civil resistant. Uh, and then you tend to have sort of actual on-chain proposals uh, where people can vote um, and then stuff goes on chain. And um, I mean, the reality is that the they, there isn't really any sort of management or kind of central brain that defines a vision for the project and um, a strategy to reach that vision and then um, operates the, the the DAO or the, the protocol like a business right sort of um, you know looks at you know its balance sheet and sort of um, thinks what assets should we acquire what assets like should we build how should we invest our capital, but also how should we finance ourselves, right? Um, like when should when should we raise our next funding round? How do we make sure we manage our cash flows? And these are all kind of this is like the actual sort of one on one. This is like the first chapter in, in every business book. But right now, sort of these sort of most basic functions are not filled in DAOs. And I think the reason is that everybody looks to everybody else to do it. Um, so, and I think that gets us to what I think is like the first solution, which is just, I, let's identify the positions in our DAOs that definitely need to be filled. And then let's make sure that we fill them with, a, you know, a dedicated person or a group of people that we then hold accountable. I, I said it in the uh, beginning of the show, it's not like crypto or DeFi or DAOs have broken through any sort of just like barrier of the law of economics. We are following the laws of economics and we have as a species refined what it means to run a business and like you know, capture value. We've are, we know this is a known science. Uh, and I think what's really missing from the DAO space is like paying attention to that model. And, and one of the reasons, very like a very small but significant thing that happened is that 
the meme, the name DAO took over, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which if you take at, at that at face value, does those three words, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, really actually describe the organizations that are governing over DeFi apps? And I would absolutely argue that no, it's just like this accidental meme that got caught on and now it's what we call these things. I've been a big proponent of do's, instead of DAOs, digital organizations, rather than decentralized autonomous organizations, because decentralized autonomous organizations were supposed to illustrate something like where there's code at the center and humans at the periphery, which I would actually really argue is just what Bitcoin and Ethereum are. Those are the actual DAOs, these like very robotic, no governance, you know, uh, humans at the at the output sending in like value to the center, a bunch of algorithms do a bunch of things and then send it back out to the humans. When there's humans at the center, it turns it into something completely different. It turns it into a digital organization, which is basically a company, an LLC, but not it's just on chain. It's just the new Web3, like crypto enabled versions of these organizations. And like this name decentralized has worked its way into the culture of so many DAOs, uh, do, which are actually dues. Uh, and now it's like, oh, we can't have processes or order or organization. We can't have centralized leadership. We can't have a centralized brain because it's a meme in this space that centralization is bad. Um, but it's the wrong form factor applied to the wrong organization. Uh, it's really dues, and dues need to have and follow the same laws of business and economics that we've refined as a species over the last thousand years. And that's really the only way to, in order to mimic that tried and true business strategy of growing an organization and capturing revenue and paying out employees and laborers and contributors, is the thing that we need to optimize for. It's really just a difference of who are these contributors how do they engage with the do and how does value flow more liquid and more easily throughout the do that is really the new paradigm that we need to optimize for. Uh, Hazu, do you agree with all, these, all this stuff? <laughs> um, it depends whether it's sort of, it's a description of the status quo or whether you think that every organization should be run like, you know, like a corporation or not. Can you elaborate on that? Well, that goes back to what we were saying, where all orgs have to have a token, and that token has to capture more value than any competitor token, and that is the moat. And so, yes, I would conclude that all DAOs must generally be run like a corporation. It's just like the best ones are going to find and change the things like, well, there's like top-down, extremely hierarchical or like uh, organizations in the Web2 TradFi world, and they don't need to be so hierarchical. They don't need to be so um, like uh, vertical and, and have such a, like a strong chain of command. It can be more flat, and that is a goal to aspire to, but there still needs to be a, a path towards we must collect revenue, there needs to be a central vision, a central goal, which leadership directs the rest of the organization towards. And then everyone else needs to be just their, their worker bees that achieve those, that means to the end. Yeah, so I think it sort of inspires the question, you know, why are the DAOs that we see so flat? And I mean, maybe a small part of the answer is that, um, especially some of the early crypto believers, they, you know, just, uh, see centralization as something bad and that they want to avoid right? and so they really believe in the power of flat organizations but i would argue that for um you know the bigger part of the DeFi founders is more that you know they are really worried about regulation um, um and, and really we're talking like different kinds of regulation here so securities regulation um so if you drive value to your token um you know, it might be a security. If you run like a hierarchical organization, it might be, you know, reliance on the managerial efforts of others might be a security. If you market it um, to like the general public um, or even perform like a public sale might be a security. And then you get into like, okay, so money laundering, you know, tax evasion, and in the case of like MakerDAO, Aave, et cetera, you also get into like banking regulation. And so that's where kind of um, the, the, the A in DAO also comes from, um, which is so, um, so Lex, Lex Note wrote an article about this a couple of months ago, and he, he called it how 
I think the article is called something like how you can discern like fake DAOs from real DAOs. And, and he gave a good, I thought a good definition of what, you know, the three letters in, in the DAO stand for and the A for him. Uh, so the autonomous for him was a, another word for sovereign, meaning that it's an organization that doesn't, you know, have to, that isn't basically subject to any of these rules. It plays by its own rules. It's a sovereign player on the global stage. And, um, yeah, it's in order to do that, you probably need a different kind of organization, one that actually has very few levers to pull, or that is, you know, credibly decentralized, whatever that means. So, um, I think the challenge that we see, I mean, either in the, over the next years, we are going to see more regulatory clarity. And I don't just mean, um, sort of regulators saying that, you know, the rules don't apply to DeFi tokens, which of, if that happened, that would be good, but, um, probably unlikely. So what's more likely is that there even is a path to get regulated if you want to, but it's in like, in the financial realm, it's extremely hard to, you know, acquire. Um, you know, the necessary licenses to do any business uh, to begin with. Um, so I think what's more likely is that sort of we see a path between sort of regulatory like leniency, but also sort of making it easier to get, you know, the, the, the necessary licenses. And up to that point, I think the alternative is really to build organizations that uh, are more decentralized um, than, than a corporation, but that um, sort of still capture some of the same benefits of sort of a more traditional organizational design. Um, yeah. And what that, what, what, which, you know, those might be, I think we already touched on some, right. I think you need, um, I mean, you definitely need, um, sort of some degree of hierarchy. Um, I think maybe it doesn't, maybe hierarchy is kind of the wrong word, but you have these different roles that need to be filled. And I think what you can't do is you can't rely on, um, just random people from your DAO to do it. Um, you have to say, this is the exact role, uh, or the task that needs to be done. And, um, you know, anyone can sort of make a bid for that. Uh, but then sort of once you get the job and you do get paid, like, uh, we want to see an output from you and be holding you accountable to that, to that output. Um, so yeah, something, something, I don't know if this word resonates with you, Hasu, but structure <laughs> comes to mind, not, not hierarchy, yeah, but structure. We just need some structure in these organizations. That's much better. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Um, yeah. and I definitely want to pit, put a pin on governance minimization as a competitive design structure, especially when it comes to regulation. And I'll also talk about a little bit more Dow design structure. I want to put, put a pin on these things, but uh, there's a rabbit hole I want to quickly go down, small, small rabbit hole, um, that is about the interaction between regulation and Dow governance. And this has to do with the conversation of yield farming and how a lot of Dow's uh, a lot of leaders, uh, you know, uh, before there was a token, the 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 leaders behind a project, they come made a, make a protocol, then they release their token, and then they aggressively yield farm it out into, you know, the space um, because of regulation. Hazu, can you walk us through like w the incentives as to why this was done so much in the last year, and like what are the perils of this? What, what's the negative outcome of this? Yeah, so I think if you approach this from you know the mindset of a traditional investor or company builder, then usually, um, so what they do is kind of it's called equity financing where you just issue tokens and um, usually you do it to raise money in order to you know fi finance your operation and expansion and growth um but sort of the way and, and it can mean also like raising money from investors and then using that money to pay you know large scale incentive programs like the ones we touched on earlier where you sort of subsidize your entire business like uber subsidizing <laughs> Um, sort of every ride that's that's taking place it's it's basically sort of yield farming with an extra step right um uh how, so however um the way that it's done in DeFi, you know it just sort of it looks extremely you know broad and you know really large scale and really unfocused and and sort of un, unstructured and as a traditional investor you kind of scratch your head about you know why it's done in this way um especially when you compare it to, 
uh, a traditional company where um, so usually um, let's say sort of a private company sells 10 percent um, you know of its cap table every round um, and then raises money for it and then puts that into sort of growth and incentives whereas here we have um, projects that give away 80 90 percent of their cap table in a sense um, to uh, investors uh, not investors but sort of they don't even get any money for it all they get is sort of um, usage of the protocol um, and yeah I think we touched on one reason why um, they are doing this they don't do it because they think it maximizes for growth they do it because they think it maximizes for decentralization they just want to you know get rid of the token and the control of the project as soon as possible in order to say that um, this project is now decentralized right? don't look at us dear regulator because we are not in charge. I mean, look, we only control 10% of the voting power. Like this is, this is, uh, th we are not pulling the strings here and not making the decisions. And also more uh, insidiously, it pays for liquidity, which towards the end of this bull market, it allowed the founders to, you know, it was like, oh yes, let's yield farm, get rid of our own control and also give us an exit because we only want to be around for six months because that's like how much this bull market has left in it. And now we're out and like, we've, we've made this protocol and now like all these yield farmers govern over it, not us. Uh, and they got, to, they got to exit. And so like no one in the traditional startup space has like a six months like exit plan like that is companies don't last for six months like you don't you don't want to have a six month roadmap for the founders the founders need to be locked in for a long long time uh they need to be tied to the protocol for for years um how would you how would you ask for this dynamic to be fixed when it comes to like founder alignment with the protocol yeah, I mean, optimally, you do have sort of long vesting schedules for founders in DeFi as well, but there are definitely some counterexamples uh, that you're probably thinking of where sort of this may not always be the case. Um, but I think you're, you're sort of pointing towards um, a, a bigger problem, which is that, um, you know, just companies in crypto, or not companies, but that protocols in crypto, they just if we sort of stretch the analogy here more to the traditional company, then they just tend to go public extremely early. Um, and like a traditional company might stay private for many years uh, and only sell shares to accredited investors. But then you have sort of a crypto company that, you know, it's extremely early uh, and they already issued tokens to the public and maybe do a public sale. Um, and this definitely creates adverse incentives um, I mean, for one, it sort of subjects the, the, the protocol to sort of the short term whims of the market, uh, un unlike sort of a, a private company where sort of the founders can just, you know, build in peace and sort of raise from investors who have a long time horizon. Um, but sort of more importantly, it gives these founders exit liquidity okay. and it creates this, I mean, especially in a market where, you know, tokens are in such high demand, um, and really like what we're selling here uh, is kind of stories that, you know, a particular uh, project might, you know, make it big in the future, then yeah, it, it does indeed create this incentive for, um, you know, protocols uh, to emerge that really put sort of <laughs> that have the, the token as the actual product um, and are sort of all built around that. And I think especially sort of in uh, last year in what we, uh, uh, what we saw labeled as like DeFi 2.0, I think uh, that entire class of, of projects, uh, I think fits uh, fits the example here of, of sort of um, the token being the actual product, very short vesting schedules, uh, et cetera. So um, I think these primarily existed, yeah, unfortunately to enrich their founders and uh, the earliest investors. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between 
between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across its critical ecosystem infrastructure and across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, Layer 2 to Layer 2 transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your Layer 2 transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 60 million monthly active users. And inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the secure multi-chain crypto wallet built right into the browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy, but there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. And most crypto wallets are browser extensions, which can easily be spoofed. But the Brave wallet is different. No extensions are required, which gives Brave browser an extra level of security versus other wallets. Brave wallet is your secure passport for the possibilities of Web3, and supports multiple chains, including Ethereum and Solana. You can even buy crypto directly inside the wallet with Ramp. And of course, you can store, send, and swap your crypto assets, manage your NFTs, and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps. So whether you're new to crypto or you're a seasoned pro, it's time to ditch those risky extensions, and it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. Arbitrum is an Ethereum layer two scaling solution that is going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Some of the coolest new NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, while DeFi protocols continue to see increased liquidity and usage. You can now bridge straight into Arbitrum from more than 10 different exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once on Arbitrum, you'll enjoy fast transactions with cheap fees, allowing you to explore new frontiers of the crypto universe. New to Arbitrum, for a limited time, you can get Arbitrum NFTs designed by the famous artists Ratwell and Sugoi for joining the Arbitrum Odyssey. The Odyssey is an eight-week-long event where you complete on-chain activities and receive a free NFT as a reward. Find out more by visiting the Discord at discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You can also bridge your assets to Arbitrum at bridge.arbitrum.io and access all of Arbitrum's apps at portal.arbitrum.1 in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be, fast, cheap, secure, and friction-free. You know, um, what's interesting about this conversation is I, I feel like all roads lead to the same destination, which is um, DeFi has a regulatory issue here. Mm -hmm. We don't have the regulatory clarity. Um, you know, it's like, why are DeFi pro uh, tokens broken? Because we can't do so many of the things we want to do because we don't have regulatory clarity. Uh, as, as you were talking, Hasu, as you guys were talking, uh, you know, I cooked up this meme. You know, it's like, I really feel like it's the case. Like the world, if we uh -huh. had regulatory clarity in DeFi uh -huh. would be so much better. And what I'm showing is like a picture of, you know, the, the classic beam template of, of a future world and everything's amazing and everything's futuristic. It feels like there's so much more we could do in crypto and in DeFi if we had this bridge to regulatory. You know, so often I think in crypto, we talk about scale scalability sort of one dimensionally, you know, transactions per second, for instance, or even if you broaden it, you might say the market cap of crypto assets is a dimension of scalability, or you might say user experience is scalability. But I also think that regulatory bridges are an element of scalability that we need. And we are kind of like growing in DeFi in this strange way because of like, let's be honest, there's some regulatory arbitrage here, right? We've had to sort of grow in this way. And the only thing that regulators will uh, really allow or have clarified that they will allow, it seems, is the A in for autonomous in decentralized autonomous organizations. So we've kind of constrained the design path for these DeFi protocols so that we're maximizing decentralization. But the truth is some protocols and some uh, projects need much more structure than complete decentralization will, will provide. And so I, I guess this is a scalability limiter on uh, DeFi and on our industry. I, I don't think it's insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination. I think as the Uniswaps of the world and the DeFi protocols of the world prove their value, we will earn more regulatory legitimacy. But it feels like that is the mismatch here. Are, are you seeing this as, as kind of a, the common theme across all your research for you know why some of these things are broken, why some of the governance could be improved? Like we know what we need to do with DAOs. Like there is a recipe book for creating a um, structure for, for companies, and we could get we could pay for the best uh, managers and like people in the world who are fantastic at this, but we're not allowed to create the structure 
because of regulatory concerns. Are you seeing this? You know, I actually kind of have two theses here that are that go back to sort of what you said about this um, regulation. Um, and I think one is one one is kind of the thesis why I think that regulation is not going to improve anytime soon. And it goes back to um, it goes back to this article that I wrote or already many years ago, just called um, independent property rights and sort of how, how Bitcoin back in the day sort of is this this new property layer. And I think you can really think this further uh, for DeFi, like blockchains in general are kind of, um, you know, proper sort of property or like systems f to enforce uh, sort of property or promises between people, right? And and the financial system, and there's like a really cool article that we can link for your listeners. It's called The Market for Promises by Anthony Li Zhang. Um, and sort of he, he makes the case that sort of financial assets are really just you know promises between people like whether that means that you know equity i get a share in your business in the future and like a claim on your dividends or you know debt i get sort of a claim on you know repayment of the principal plus uh you know uh, interest or whether it means sort of more complicated structures like derivatives on sort of uh you know um, stock market indices or you know futures options all of these kind of delivery products and um, there is a big reason why sort of financial markets are so strong in the west and so weak everywhere else which is that you know markets for promises uh, depend on the uh, like lower layers sort of that can enf enforce actually these promises especially under very adverse conditions and court systems yes ex settlement insurances. exactly it's like and this goes back to like uh, um, sort of strong property rights and the strong independent legal system um and so yeah markets for promises have have been traditionally sort of been one of the core things that you know nation states and and governments in the west uh are providing um and this sort of locks a lot of uh, you know both people but also companies especially companies you know into their respective domains and so i think this like i think there is a case here for why the western nations will fight very hard for domain over these market for promises. Ha Hasu, let me mm -hmm. let me make sure I understand that case. So this is the bad case. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm hopeful you also have a good case. <laughs> um, right? So we'll get to that in a second. Not, but like it's not just so if you read the if you read the article for uh, by Anthony, he he it's actually a bull case for him because what he's saying is that um the western the west the west will shut down, you know, shut itself out of this innovation. But um, especially everywhere else in the world where sort of you have very weak uh, property rights and legal systems, that's where there's much stronger demand for an independent market for promises that uh, especially companies can tap into. And that's, that, that's like a, a real case sort of how DeFi can bridge to the real world maybe much faster than currently anyone is expecting. And, and he's saying he could imagine sort of a wild west for financial innovation you know emerging in sort of southeast asia and africa um and all of these sort of uh, or, and south america and all of these places that that sort of um are sort of not really served right now by you know the capital markets of the west and so it's actually sort of a mix between like a, a bear and a bull case but i really love this as uh you know an explanation of sort of why def like why do we defy right um and it's kind of that um, you can't have markets for, for promises without a strong enforcement system for these promises. And um, without, w without effective markets for promises, our economy would be, uh, you know, 1% the size. I'm like really convinced of that because like our economy is so financialized and financialization um, like empowers the economy so much that like it, it if you have this, you can really like supercharge your economy. So I think that's that's definitely sort of one one case. And then I <laughs> I, I just I, I just want to comment on that case. Like so so first of all, I think uh, David and I um, it, bankless the bankless thesis hundred percent believes that these are systems that are about property rights at the core. Mm -hmm. That's a base. We don't layer. call it the bankless nation for nothing. <laughs> but, you know, like. Um, money is just a, another form of, of property, of course, yeah. right? And um, that's what these ledgers are. They're ledgers for digital property rights. 
Um, but just to kind of echo in, make sure I understand what you're saying. So, um, the, it's, ba- it's basically the, it's a bear case for if you live in the West, maybe, <laughs> or if you are a Western government, government, the bear case is the West won't accept it. And I think it's because you were saying they believe they already have a system and this upstart competitor is kind of infringing on their territory. And so they're not going to embrace it. You know, best case scenario, you get sort of like a, a shrugging the shoulders, ignoring it. Uh, and like maybe it, it ekes itself into a few niches here or there. And that's, that's maybe the West re- reaction or the, the uh, countries with sophisticated financial markets and property rights system. But the, the bull case on the flip side of that is uh, in emerging markets where there really is not a sophisticated property rights system uh, in place. They will be very quick to embrace these technologies. And that's great news for emerging markets because they will be able to leapfrog like the West. You know, it's, it's kind of uh, similar. We've seen this play out in technology in the past where, um, you know, everyone kind of skipped the, in emerging markets. You kind of skipped the, the PC yeah. and the laptop and you went straight to, to smartphones. Uh, and those, those are the kind of computers and they you know built out the telecom yeah, networks to exactly. support that. So and it's, like mobile, it's mobile that's sort of the argument penetration is like much higher in Africa and India than than like in Central Europe and uh and Yeah, so US, is it is it the tone yeah. is it the tone that the West will feel like kind of or the West uh-huh. like sophi- countries with sophisticated property rights system they'll feel threatened by this technology and so they'll never really want to embrace it. They'll they'll be dragged into it kicking and st- is screaming. Is that the case that you're making? I yeah, I think I think it's possible. Yeah. Okay, what's the second case then? So the, the, the second case would be that regulation can actually be a bull case for DeFi. Um, and this is kind of one that I, I've been giving for, for years also with regards to sort of Bitcoin in the past. Um, because regulation can also serve, you know, DeFi projects uh, to protect them from incumbents. That if there's actually something that DeFi projects can offer, you know, in spite of regulation, um, that incumbents can, then that's a, a big competitive benefit. Um, for example, they can offer banking services without a banking license. They can, you know, not pay taxes uh, and stuff Bank like that. Bankless services, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, and um, I, so I think you see this. I'm not sure if like the banking sector is sort of a good example for this, but in general, sort of the, the history of regulation is very often you will have sort of incumbents pushing the government to add more regulation in order to um, create barriers um, for new that make it harder for new uh, entrants to come into the market and compete with them. So they kind of do this to protect their turf. But then when someone comes into the market anyway, for example, as was the case with you know Uber and Lyft um, versus the taxi medallions, then all of a sudden you see that the regulation actually works against the incumbent and it makes it harder for them to compete against um, sort of the, the new entrant. And then all of a sudden you'll see the incumbent um, asking the government to please deregulate so they can you know, compete again. Um, and um, yeah, so I think something like that is also possible where if we actually manage to find or create you know, uh, working DeFi protocols that can scale and that are supported by you know, actually decentralized, but nonetheless, effective organizations, then uh, it means that you probably like th- these projects probably have a lot of advantages that their regulated counterparts do not have. I, I love this example. I think we're actually seeing this this play out. And it strikes me that um, both kind of your vision one and your vision two could both be at play at the same time. It could be like some combination of these two visions. But I want to ask you about the point of like, one uh, incumbent reaction you mentioned is the incumbents go to regulators and they say, we're too regulated, please deregulate us. The, the other reaction incumbents might have, and you know we might be seeing some of this already, is the incumbents might point to the DeFi protocols and they might say, this isn't fair, you better go <laughs> regulate them. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like we have Sarbanes, we have like 10K, rep- we have all of these things. They don't. So you better go get them out of here or regulate them in the same way that we are regulated. Do you think that's a possible incumbent reaction? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. I think mm-hmm. I think that's probably already happening. 
Yeah. I mean, for example, I, I think definitely um, uh, like stablecoin issuers are effectively shadow banks, right? They, they are sort of issuing their own euro dollars. Um, and uh, what, what you, I think what you will, ex what you will, uh, so if like Tether and Circle, et cetera, like keep growing like that, then you will probably see, um, you know, incumbent banks that actually have banking licenses and, and so on, they will, you know, push for, you know, these competitors to be regulated because of course um, it's bad for the banks if someone can offer banking services without banking licenses. So I, I just want to, you know, zoom out because this, um, I guess, worry uh, from yeah, critics or people in the, in the space about crypto has been present with crypto and, and Bitcoin since the early beginnings, which is basically the, the worry of the government is going to not allow this. They are going to regulate this thing that you're trying to do out of existence. They said that in the early days with, with Bitcoin, like you can't create a decentralized money. What are you talking about? Like governments around the world have thrown people in jail when they've tried to create monies in the past. And yet, Bitcoin is still legal here in you know 2022. And it is um, like more, more saturated and more part of, of, of mainstream uh, than ever. So at some level, this, um, this problem has been with us, with, with us forever. And yet crypto has survived and crypto has kind of infiltrated in all of these various ways. I'm wondering if you think that um, the basic argument of game theory is, is kind of at play here in that if you are a regulatory friendly uh, cri uh, crypto regulatory friendly jurisdiction, you're going to attract uh, more productive citizens, uh, more jobs, um, like more economic benefits from a friendlier posture to crypto than an anti crypto posture. And so, as a country, as a regulated uh, regulatory apparatus, you will be slowly forced to embrace crypto for game theory reasons, because, because you can't let Europe, if you're the US, have the advantage, or um, if you're China, you can't have the let the US have an advantage. You can't let emerging markets uh, leapfrog you. This has always been sort of my hopeful um, response when people say, no, the, the government's going to regulate this stuff you're trying to do out of existence. Uh, the response has always been, no, the game theory won't let them because this technology is so productive, so useful that they'll they'll be forced to adopt it in the same way that countries were forced to mm -hmm. adopt the internet. W what do you think of this uh, argument? Yeah, I think this argument has been in play um, for a long time. I think there's definitely some merit to it. I think it applies more to smaller countries that have sort of more to gain than to lose. And I think I guess it's not really like unexpected that we see sort of these smaller countries making moves on, you know, crypto regulation and also, you know, buying crypto, um, etc. Um, so far, uh, I can't really point to, you know, an ex example where it really sort of worked out for them in a major way. Um, but it's the, like, of course, it's really early, right? So um, I think definitely one place where we shouldn't expect it is maybe in sort of um, I think in Europe, it's, it's much harder and uh, in, the, in the US it's much harder. Why? Because I mean, these have much more to lose, right? So they, they have sort of the incumbent currencies, China as well. Um, so, um, in like the context of sort of layer one crypto, I think for them, um, you know, it, it, it just makes much more sense to, to ban it than to support it. But if, if you don't have sort of a reserve currency, then. I think it's much more, you know, for, for you, it may not really matter, like if it's like the dollar or the euro or the yen or, you know, some cryptocurrency. So I think you're much more open to, you know, whatever option and you're, you're more interested in, you know, attracting capital, attracting young people, etc. So I would say this argument um, of like, um, yeah, it's kind of a, in a sense, it's like a, a tragedy of the commons, right? From the perspective of sort of the, the, the protectors of the existing system where like there's always the incentive for some nations to defect and, you know, check these resources. Um, and sort of that, that's, I think what we've seen and that's what I would, you know, continue, expect, you know, us to continue to see. So we've talked a lot about regulation and the what we want to see out of the regulatory world that would enable DAOs to, be their best DAO, be their best version of themselves. But I, I think if we flip things around and we put ourselves in the shoes of a regulator, 
We would also ask for DAOs for the same thing, which would be clarity. Uh, and there's that's one thing that DAOs don't really have to offer right now. DAOs are so chaotic. They're so undefined. They need more clarity. Uh, like if we, Regulators would love to be able to peer inside of a DAO and see what's going on in there. And maybe, maybe that's where we can meet in the middle. And what I mean by this is that you know, we've talked about the, the need of structure and organization inside of DAOs. Uh, but Hazo, you've been a big proponent of DAO constitutions, as in setting a vision for a DAO and having this like central North Star piece of literature that allows for a DAO to organize around itself. And I think this can start to solve some both internal problems to the DAO, where DAOs don't have their own internal vision for what they are. They don't have their own internal identity. But also it's this thing, this constitution, this document that we can take uh, externally and show the world, like, not only do we know who we are, but we can tell you, the world, who we are too. Can you talk about the role and importance of having like a constitution for a DAO? Yeah. I, but before I do that, I want to actually pick up on sure. something that you said like, sure. right before, which I think is really interesting, which is that I'm not even, I'm not sure about you, um, but for me, I, I'm not like, do you feel that sort of token holders in a DAO right now are more protected than, you know, equity holders in a company in the West? No, no, because of what no. the hell is a DAO? Yeah. It's the same thing. Like, I don't, I, I don't know what it is. Exactly. So I like personally, I feel like it's like, it doesn't even feel good to say, you know, DAOs shouldn't be regulated right. or like people should buy DAO tokens. It, it, does, it does, doesn't feel good to me because when I look at, uh, when I look at corporate governance, you know, Every, so the way it works basically is every um, country has sort of a list of rules for corporate governance. These are sort of, you know, best practices that all companies that are listed in the public markets um, have to follow. And there's a lot of good stuff in there. One is that the company should be run, um, you know, to the benefit of the shareholder. And then there's one that's sort of all stakeholders of the company that's like suppliers, employees, um, customers, et cetera, they should all be, you know, considered in the decision-making. One is about the protection of minority shareholders. Um, and one is about accountability of the management to the, to the owners of the company and sort of that the, the owners get to elect the board and then the board gets to elect, you know, a CEO and fire them. So you have like really clearly defined sort of structures of accountability and so on. And. Uh, and also sort of a big one is about disclosure, right? So um, what, who is supposed to have what information, like um, the managers and board members, like do they need to, um, what do they need to disclose? For example, as a, as a manager, you're not allowed to trade, uh, you know, the stock of your own company, stuff like that, right? And if I look at DAOs, I just don't see any of the same protections and that just makes me feel really bad about investing in DAOs. And um, I think if we create, I think, so the biggest thing that we need to do is like, first of all, we need to get like level with, um, you know, the shareholder protections that exist in the traditional financial system. Um, because in theory, we have all the tools to do it, right? I mean, in, in theory, we are operating in theory, like, Decentralized organizations should serve to protect minority shareholders better, but in practice, they do it worse. Um, in theory, they should be like more resistant to entrenchment and insider dealing, um, but in practice, they are not at all. Um, in, in theory, they should be sort of harder to change and, you know, trust this, but in practice, they are not. And so, yeah, I, th I see all of these problems right now, and I, I think we need to like really start to uh, you know, look at, um, you know, corporate governance, best practices, not because we want to turn DAOs into corporations, but, be cheap, but because sort of corporate governance is fundamentally about solving principal agent problems, uh, sort of between minority and majority shareholders, between owners and managers, between like, it's like there's so much good research. Right. On it's this. a science and, that they have per yes. per perfected. And we would be uh, the hubris of DAOs to think that that is just like invalid and not relevant to them is off the charts. But, but do you know what? As, as you guys are talking about this, um, you know, what I find that. So 
I will, I completely agree that um, the investor rights, investor protections of DAO tokens suck. They're inferior to holding U.S. stock. Like they totally are. But you know what is better than U.S. stock is like the underlying crypto rails mm, of an ERC-20, right? Like that my Apple stock is stuck in an E-Trade account somewhere and I can't do jack with it, right? Whereas like in this programmable DeFi world, my goodness, how many opportunities, like you could do all sorts of things with an ERC-20 uh, token, um, unlock like certain pages, like Discord access, vote in different ways, uh, lock it as collateral in another protocol, trade it anywhere in the world. All you need is an internet connection, withdraw at any time. Like it's really, that's the value proposition of the thing is the token that's on these new digital rails that are open, permissionless and program. It's almost like we built a better banking system, but we haven't built a better uh, investor rights um, asset yet. Mm -hmm. 100 percent yeah so we can point to all of these things that are sort of worse for shareholders right now but we can also point to a lot of things that are better than traditional markets right i mean so crypto DeFi projects they get access to if they had, if they want to raise from like public mark like public markets they get to tap into you know very liquid sort of funding markets they get to attract customers from all over the world without like having to acquire all of these regulations and so on. Um, you know, they can be non-custodial. Um, they can be extremely cheap to build. I think that's sort of one of the biggest, like the go-to market in DeFi and sort of the, the, the speed with which you can iterate on your product is just insanely fast. I was talking to a DeFi founder the other day and, and he said, um, Hasu, like we built this, like they have a, they have like a mainnet protocol out that they build um on less than a million dollars in funding um and it's it now has over like 100 million tvl um and and making revenue already and i mean so they built this in like one year on less than a million dollars which is insane and so um you in theory sort of all of the promises of DeFi they are holding right it's it's like with not the entire stack is broken like some parts of the stack are extremely promising um, it's just that sort of the organizational part and sort of the, uh, you know, the alignment between the, the shareholder, um, and sort of the operators and, and sort of the, the shareholder protections. I think that is something that we need to focus on next, um, and really look how we can address it. And I think that's what brings us back around to, um, you know, what you were originally asking, uh, about with the constitution. Yeah. Tell us about that then. Um, yeah, so I think the governance design space, I think, I mean, there are some, there are like a lot of ways you can approach this, right? So you can have, I mean, of, of course, it's, it's best if you have a, a protocol that sort of, you put it out there and it's set in stone. It's like almost like an NFT, right? Almost like Bitcoin. Uh, it's funny how like the Bitcoin protocol is also almost like an NFT in the sense that it has barely been improved <laughs> after the original launch. And so you can really not say that there's any expectation, you know, that the value of Bitcoin sort of depends on, you know, the managerial effort or of anyone. Right, clearly right? not a security, Gary Gensler. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, but unfortunately, like if you can have that, I mean, that's, that's great, but it's also <laughs> extremely hard. And I, I think most, uh, you know, DeFi protocols are not going to fall into this category. Um, we are seeing some experiments that are maybe like worth pointing out. So I think Rye is kind of very, uh, you know, governance minimized and then liquidity is somewhere sort of in the middle. And so it's not like there are projects kind of experimenting with how they can minimize the need to govern. Um, but then there are also others where, you know, uh, just decisions need to be made in order for um, you know, this, this thing to work, uh, for example, looking at Aave or compound, they need to, um, you know, tune uh, interest rate curves. They need to decide what collateral to add and, you know, all kinds of parameters. They need to decide how to, you know, expand, especially now that the DeFi world is getting more and more fragmented. They need to like decide how they want to 
expand across you know um, to other DeFi chains and how they want to like set the the debt limits how they communicate across chains so there's like so many technological and organizational problems that they need to address also like how to set incentives um really like it's it's like a lot of a lot of things that if you want these to be successful then it's just like it's a big complicated problem that you have to solve and so the question is then if you don't have the luxury of having you know a protocol that doesn't need any governance how can you do it in a way that is not strictly hierarchical that is not centralized basically you don't just put a, a traditional corporation um, in place to manage and run this protocol um, and so I think it goes back to like this one keyword that we had which is structure right if you need um, if you need a group of people to organize uh, or to, to sort of um, you know make decisions then you know at the very least you, you, you know you want it to be like less chaotic than it is right now I think um, that's where this idea of um, of sort of uh, a constitution comes from. So we said, okay, let's put as much sort of in code as possible and make it like immutable. But what if we, what about things where, you know, we can't do that uh, because it's not code, because it's, let's say it's like the vision for our protocol and that it changes like once every year or once every other year or whatever. Um, or what, what if it's about sort of the relationships or like the rights um, and responsibilities of different actors in the system. I think this is stuff that you would, that you can put into a constitution and then the constitution says, okay, this is all the stuff that we can't put in code. Here's the vision for what this protocol is supposed to do. Defines here these five groups of shareholders and they have these rights and responsibilities. Um, and uh, yeah, these, if possible, should never change. And if you do change them, then at least you know um, you can't just change them on like a higher layer. Then you need to actually go back and um, sort of deal with the constitution itself and say, hey, I'm making a proposal to change the constitution. I think, you know, this and that should change or be amended. And, um, and you can, and this can, for example, require like a lot higher uh, buy-in and like uh, the decision for that needs to be sort of a lot more, um, uh, and it's a lot more consensus than, for example, it's something that happens like on a on a layer like way higher on the stack. So this is like an organizational operating system, basically. Yeah. Social code. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, great point. And th this is something I've actually spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, and I don't really think that this actually stops at a highest level constitution. Uh, DAOs, blockchains themselves, operate kind of, I think they will operate like a court system where, and we also still need to talk about in this episode, uh, token voting and the broken nature of token voting. Um, but I, I think the, the token vote, the global DAO, the global DAO token vote really only needs to come to vote uh, collectively as a DAO when it comes to change the constitution. As in like there, I, some, some part of the DAO is going to propose that we're going to change the constitution of the DAO in the, this particular way. That triggers off a global token vote. But as there are sub constitutions, because there's going to be sub DAOs, we've already seen Ave, Synthetics, Bankless DAO break off into sub DAOs because of, you know, modularity is just a, a strong design structure and is efficient when it comes to DAO organization. And so like, say you have like the, you know, the meta DAO, MakerDAO, right? And like MakerDAO's got the core units, uh, but then you have like uh, the growth core unit of MakerDAO and they can have their own constitution for the growth core unit about what the growth core unit does. And that's a constitution that only the growth core unit votes on, not the rest of the DAO, only that gr growth core unit. And like maybe the growth core unit fractures off into three more sub DAOs that are just, you know, teams, just like work, work streams, and they have their own mi micro sub constitution, and they decide, and that's just like what they are deciding to do as a micro sub DAO in Q3 2022. And so what this turns into is like a tree structure, which is basically like a GitHub repository. It's like this fractal tree structure that grows into and creates a modular DAO that has every part of it being defined by a piece of literature, a, a vision, a roadmap that allows this organization to be highly scalable 
And this is the, the this not just like the meta constitution for the DAO as a whole, but also the sub DAOs and the micro sub DAOs each also get to concretely show the world this is what we do. And it works like GitHub. It's like we merge this into our local constitution, which gets merged up into the greater constitution, which emulates the goddamn United States of America. Again, a tried and true science that we already know about to this uh, day. So so I, I guess, David, also what you just described to me is mm -hmm. just like, it, this is corporate governance, man. Right. So replace sub DAOs for like business unit or mm -hmm. uh, department area and re replace kind of like the sub teams you were talking about to like different areas of responsibility in a corporation. It, replace token vote with a, a shareholder proxy vote of some sort with delegates right i mean, I mean we're kind of like back we've, to like we run these things like are, i'm sorry ryan have we said the line we are speed running the the history of human coordination enough on this podcast before i just think somebody somebody with some um organizational um structuring experience is gonna is gonna come to this podcast and be like uh yeah guys yeah, you that's idiots. how you do it what do you think it took you 12 years to figure this out what do you think of this hasu yeah, you should have Professor Andy Hall on the podcast. I think he think he would be a tremendous guest to yeah. to riff riff is, on the subject with. Yeah, is he a he's an a kind of an org structure specialist? Exactly. Yeah, he he's he's been making some contribution, some articles to um, to MakerDAO, and recently published something for uh, A16Z. Um, yeah, he he's like of the opinion that we need um, that sort of. Um, DAOs are sort of we need to get to the, like the representative democracy stage so this is something we haven't touched on yet right which is kind of um owners making decisions versus sort of their elected agents making decisions on their behalf um and then you want probably i think i, I think what this basically does is if you look at DAOs today then um you just see sort of huge voter apathy right, right? so you see like right. five percent uh, uh, so five percent of like the the voters the votes participating in every vote, and what this means is of course sort of the most motivated. Like if there's one motivated way way they can push through almost any proposal in DAOs, and this is like part of what's create what creates this you know big problem for uh, minority shareholders in DAOs, uh, which is that if you're a whale, then you can do whatever you want. Um, and oftentimes sort of they have different incentives than, you know, shareholder that's like a smaller size, right? Um, and so what we really need to do is we need to, you know, get uh, if uh, participation up in these votes. And I think it's much easier to do if you sort of reduce the mental overhead and the decision for uh, governance participants to, uh, okay, let me vote, like, let me sort of elect a person who I think like really represents what I think this DAO should do versus let me vote on, you know, all of these, all of these 10 proposals that go live every week. Um, so the mental overhead for, um, you know, the law is extremely high, whereas the right. mental overhead for the former is very low. And so, um, and then sort of your, your, um, your delegates, they can be, you know, this can be sort of, full-time you know salaried roles i think we are right. this is something that we are now seeing in daos which is it's a step in the right direction because it allows specialization uh in decision making um and it allows like consistency also among who the decision makers actually are um but yeah i think this is only this is only the the starting point for i think mm -hmm. a lot of the innovation that has to happen in dao governance Certainly. And uh, I, I read your, I believe, uh, proposal for, for MakerDAO, which has kind of outlined the structure that you think MakerDAO needs to go in. And this is where this like constitution idea came into my head. And you, you said like MakerDAO doesn't have a aligned vision. There are competing visions for what MakerDAO is. Some people think it's a public good. Some people think it's a decentral bank. You know, some people want it to do real world assets. Some people want it to be ether only. And this lack of vision means that like different parts of the DAO are having this tug of war against each other, trying to pull MakerDAO in this different direction. And just from a raw energy perspective, when there's a internal tug of war pulling one thing in two different directions, that is 
you know, you're, you're going nowhere because you're tugging against each other. But if you can get everyone to point in the same direction and then tug, that goes from a tug of war to progress. Uh, and, and this, when we talk about why we need, well, how to fix DeFi tokens, when we turn our energy, which is, you know, tugging one rope against our own teammates and that rope's not going anywhere and we reorient it to we tug the organization going in the correct direction like the current state of DAO governance is a big hole that we need to plug i don't know if you've ever like crunched any numbers or done any napkin math hazu as to like how costly DAO governance is um but i would imagine that it's one of the biggest expenditures that DAOs have as an organization is that we need like global token votes on like who who's going to have what for breakfast on that morning. <laughs> and that is just, ex that's costly. That's expensive. And that ends up as sell pressure in the secondary markets. Have you, ha have you done any sort of like analysis or, or have any thoughts on this? I mean, that's sort of the, the actual cost, the tangible cost. So MakerDAO spends like, I don't know, it, it has like, uh, it spends, it pays $2 million, I think right now a year on, you know, paying delegates. And then that's of course, all of this, <laughs> the cost of on-chain voting. Um, but then there's all of this time that's being put in by, by all of the participants playing these governance games, right? And I think, so the biggest problem that I see is that sort of people who are good politicians, they, you know, sort of are much better at playing these games, right? Um, I, I see people who have like a very good strategic mind to understand very good sort of what the, 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 the business model of MakerDAO should be, but maybe they are not the best communicators. Maybe they are not the most popular. And I think, so one good way that, um, for example, um, representative democracies in the West have found with this is that there are uh, elected parties and then they get sort of, if you vote for them, they go in power. Um, but then you also have full-time employees uh, that work for the government all the time and they don't need to be elected, right? They are actually um, put in place on merit and not on popularity. Um, and so I think that DAOs, um, they kind of need both, right? I think um, there's right now, I mean, very clearly there's way too much voting. Um, and uh, so this covers so the tangible cost, but also this huge field of like opportunity cost, like we, because we don't actually know where we're going we don't have a coherent vision. Instead, we are voting on every kind of micromanagement decision. Although if we ever sat down and put our strategy in place and our vision, then a lot of these decisions would actually derive automatically from them. And so one big theme uh, for me personally uh, in governance and with all of the projects that I work with is sort of don't have governance over decisions, have governance over processes. And then sort of decisions should derive from processes and the processes themselves, they can be updated much less regularly. So Hazu, let's uh, summarize this and, and turn this into some action items for all the DAO governors out there that are listening to this, who are now inspired. It's like, oh, I, need, I know what I need to do to make my DAO work. Uh, what, what are the simplest, lowest hanging fruits that all DAOs need to consider and engage in uh, with that they should tackle first? And then after that, like, where should they go after that? Just what are the action items here? Let's see. Okay. So a big one is, um, you know, treat your DAO like a business. That doesn't mean treat it like a corporation, but, you know, think of it as like, think of your DAO as having a balance sheet and, you know, needing to manage its liquidity and its cash flow and needing your DAO to make money. Right. Maybe not today, but you should have a plan how you want to grow it and how you want to make money in the future. Because otherwise, like raising money from people, if you don't have a plan on making money for them in the future, I think that's unethical and that's not, you know, actually good for crypto. And then number two would be, uh, I think we need more structure in DAOs. I think we need governance over processes and not over decisions. So. I think a constitution would be great for every DAO. Like, let's just eliminate discussion about 90% of things. <laughs> um, and, you know, just focus on, it's painful to do a constitution once and like agree on it. But once you have it, then all of a sudden everything else becomes much more streamlined and much more productive because now you talk about, okay, how can we do thing X and not all of the time should we do X, Y, or Z? And I get every sort of, 
um, decision point, sort of these fundamentals debate, the fundamental debates pop up again. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think more structure is good. I think, um, you want to have like small committees. I think if you want, if you want thing X to be done, then what the DAO should do is should say, uh, like here's task X and like, let's put like a committee of these five people in place and they don't even need to be employees of the DAO necessarily, right? They can be like one executive of the DAO and like other external people, um, basically specialists in whatever that thing that needs to be done is. And then, you know, they get a clear scope and, um, you know, they get the thing done. Um, and I don't, I don't think that this really like constitutes sort of centralization, right? It's really just like a decentralized group of people coming together and saying, we need to do thing X and here are like five experts who we're going to pay and they are going to do it. And if they did the job, then we release the money. And I think that's kind of this kind of, um, you know, DAOs making high level, like d debating about vision and strategy and like making high level, uh, investment allocation decisions. I think that scales much more than what we see today, where, uh, sort of a lot of small, uh, decisions are also kicked to, um, to token holders. Uh, so Hasu, as we uh, start to close this out, we we've talked about, um, so much, you know, so many things that um, need to be built, really. And this kind of reminds me of, you know, it's only in the bear market we start <laughs> like peeling these layers back and talking about this deeply and thinking about it. Um, I think um, your post, your excellent post from earlier this year about Dow Treasuries somewhat fell on deaf ears because people were like, hey, it's the bull market. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't be gloomy, Hasu. Now people are, are paying more attention and it's clear we have, we have so much work to do. Um, can you give me the case for why we should be optimistic about DeFi and tokens. And, and do you believe we actually should? What, what are the reasons maybe for optimism? And, and why are you spending your, uh, your time here? Why are, you, why are you spending your career here right now, Hasu? I'm extremely optimistic about you know, DeFi and public blockchains over a longer time frame because I think they offer um, you know, a syst like a trust machine or a system for sort of the enforcement of contracts and promises that are outside of the traditional financial system, uh, the traditional legal system, and they are not dependent on any nation states. And I mean, much like the early internet, I think it's still, it's not super clear, like what is going to be built on top of this and how, like how it's going to change the world. But I just have this feeling that, um, it's going to unlock a lot of innovation and it will unlock like markets that are more global than ever before. And that have, um, that, that sort of everybody can access, um, and that are really sort of, uh, you know, they will create much more equity, uh, and equality in the world and, um, where, uh, where everybody can participate. So that would be my hope. I think, um, as for the DeFi, um, projects. I think that um, we need more innovation in the field of DAO governance. I think we need to look at corporate governance, not because we want to copy, um, you know, all of it one to one and, and just, you know, uh, basically create a corporation and put a DAO label on top. I think that's not what we should do. But corporate governance is an extremely rich field that has done a lot of research on principal agent problems in human organization and how to get things done. And, um, and so I think, uh, over the next year, I would really love to see, um, sort of more experimentation with our governance structures and, and really by, uh, by the end of then 2023, I think we'll hopefully have a lot of positive examples to point to for DAOs that, you know, really do it better and that are both sort of great business, but also great investment cases. Yeah, so on, on that, on DeFi tokens and DAO tokens as an investable asset class, what would flip you to being more bullish on those as assets? What things would need to happen? Um, well, I think for one, if there's like more regulatory clarity, I think that's big. I mean, either because we know it's okay or we know that, you know, um, <laughs> there's no enforcement <laughs> sort of happening. Um, but what would make me even more bullish is sort of if we just solve our own problems. Uh, so we find governance structures that are more streamlined and, and more efficient and that give 
just overall more uh, power to shareholders. And not in the sense that, you know, we have them vote on more things, because I think that's the exact opposite of what of what should be happening. Uh, I think we need, and I think more DAOs need to be run like businesses. And I think that should give, um, you know, investors the confidence that, um, you know, the thing that they buy, uh, you know, there are other uh, investors and, uh, you know, uh, and workers, etc., cetera, um, who, who will try to, you know, maximize the value of that investment. Fantastic. Hasu, thank you for uh, guiding us through all this. This has been a, a fascinating discussion. I think exactly what, um, what crypto needs right now. So I, I appreciate all your work in this area and for joining us on Bankless today. No, thank you. Guys, some action items for you. I'm just going to recap what Hasu said. If you are a DAO governor, a few things you can do. Number one, create a constitution. Think about that. Uh, number two, treat your DAO like a business. Number three, focus more on structure. Govern over decision, decision processes, not the decisions themselves. Number four, break up into some uh, the projects into smaller units. Those are some low-hanging fruit areas that we could do. Of course, a lot more on the DAO structure, DAO governance side needs to be built out. A few other action items for you. They'll be in the show notes, but um, Hasu listed a number of resources, some articles today, one by Gabriel Shapiro, uh, Fake DAO versus Real DAOs, another, the Anthony Lee Zhang article, The Market for Promises. We'll also include links to Hasu's recent Maker Governance post, which gets you an idea of what the constitution, a DAO constitution might look like. And of course, uh, if you are not a Bankless Premium member, David and I want to cordially invite you to become one because you can join the debrief episode that David and I are recording right after this episode. Debrief is an opportunity for David and I to give our reflections on the episode. It's just kind of unscripted canon. We just hit the button, we record, we unpack, and we talk yeah. about stuff that we didn't get to uh, chat about in the episode. So it's um, it's a lot of fun. Number one, David, what else would you say about debriefs? Well, it won't be happening in this particular episode, but sometimes that's where we get spicy about the guests. Uh, <laughs> uh, nothing, Hazu, nothing about you. This episode was fantastic, but sometimes uh, we have to unpack what the guest, uh, what we disagreed with the guest on. Um, but uh, I don't think there was a single word that came out of Hazu's mouth that we disagreed on. Uh, so David, you're supposed to hype it up, man. Yeah. There's <laughs> definitely going to be some disagreements with you, Hazu, in the debrief. And you have to become a premium member if you want to hear those. That's usually for when we host Alt Layer One. Uh, panels and stuff like this. Um, there you go. Hazu, Guys. this has been super exceptional. I think this episode is going to go down as the canonical episode that DAOs need to follow in order to build our way out of the bear market because that's really what this episode is for. Uh, this bear market isn't just going to immaculately end just like the last bear market didn't immaculately end. Uh, we are going to build our way out of this bear market just like last time. And I think you have helped us articulate a vision for how we actually do that. So thank you so much. This has been, I hope, a great service to this industry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Risks and disclaimers, of course. As always, guys, none of this has been financial advice. Crypto risk is risky, so is DeFi. You could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.